What's the right size for the federal deficit? A deficit small enough that it doesn't alarm people or financial markets, yet large enough that it makes a difference and actually stimulates the economy. What's the Goldilocks deficit? Deficits, of course, are when government spending exceeds revenues. If we look at history, the fact is that for much of the last hundred years, every Canadian government has run deficits. And for most of that period, it wasn't a problem. Deficits in the past, for instance, have helped pay for some very large expenditures. World War II, for instance. And in peacetime, the St. Lawrence Seaway was built in the 1950s, a massive infrastructure project that helped bring Western Canadian wheat to world markets. All this comment and concern about deficits is really a recent development in Canadian politics. The new Liberal government is going to bring down its first budget about a month from now. If it announces, say for argument's sake, a deficit of $30 billion in the coming fiscal year, there's going to be a lot of discussion. Is that affordable? Anytime you start talking about deficits, people become concerned because deficits become added to the national debt. So is that a problem? There are different ways of calculating government debt. But the most meaningful way, according to the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, is to calculate net government debt, government debt after taking account of financial assets. And Canada's net government debt last year, 2015, was $612 billion. Since the money amount changes over time, the economy keeps growing, and you have to take account of inflation, the most meaningful way to measure debt and deficit is to compare them to the size of the total economy. That way you can make a meaningful comparison between 1995 and 2015 and you can compare Canada's situation with other countries. Now Canada's total economy in size is worth about $2,000 billion. So a $612 billion debt is equal to about 30%, perhaps a bit more, of the total economy. For instance, here's a chart with a 30-year timeline along the bottom from 1983 to 2013. The vertical axis going up the side shows the net debt as a share of the economy. And here's our red line showing where the net debt has stood over the past 30 years. Near the beginning of this chart in 1984, the federal deficit was actually at 8% of the total economy. Now, 8% in today's economy would mean a deficit of $160 billion, eye-popping. And 8% back then was way bigger than the annual growth rate of the economy. So the net debt was growing rapidly. And as you can see from this chart, it continued to grow through the 1980s and into the 1990s. And things only got worse during the recession from 1990 to 1992. Tax revenues were down and employment insurance costs skyrocketed. In 1992, the federal government's credit rating was actually downgraded by the Wall Street credit rating agency Standard & Poor. For a large borrower like the Government of Canada, the last thing you want is for the capital markets to start looking at you as a credit risk. By 1995, the federal deficit was $33 billion. That's about 3.5% of the economy back then. More ominously, the net debt had grown to almost 70% the size of the total economy. The Wall Street Journal warned that Canada was going to hit a debt wall. And there was more and more talk of Canada facing a fiscal crisis. We're going to create a chart here and look at the course of federal government spending and revenues over the past 20 years, beginning in 1995. You can see the timeline stretching along the bottom here. Now, any time you want to compare figures over a 20-year period, you run into a few issues. First, there's inflation. A dollar 20 years ago was worth more than a dollar today. And yet the economy today is larger than the economy was 20 years ago. That matters because a bigger economy has more people and therefore requires more spending 
And a bigger economy also has a higher tax capacity because there's more people to pay taxes. So we're going to measure spending and revenues on this chart, not in dollar terms, but as shares of the Canadian economy. That makes it easier to compare them over time. And here is what federal government spending looked like over the last 20 years. Starting on the left-hand side, you can see that federal spending back in 1995 was just a bit higher than 21% of the economy. The highest point was actually a few years earlier in 1993 when federal spending topped out at 23% of the economy. Beginning in 1995, federal spending started to fall. Paul Martin was the finance minister and the liberal government of Jean Chrétien at the time, and Martin led the charge. Government spending was slashed, departmental budgets and transfers to the provinces for health and education spending. By 1999, federal spending was down to just 16% of the economy. Now we're going to add in this red line that shows federal government revenue over the same period. You can see that in the late 1990s, federal government revenues were growing. This was due to a number of factors. There were a slew of special taxes brought in by Finance Minister Paul Martin higher gas and tobacco taxes, a special capital tax on uh, banks and insurance companies, and a special corporate surtax. And tax revenue also grew because the tax that everybody loves to hate, the GST, was reliably taking its share of all that extra economic activity. You see, the economy had finally recovered from the recession of the early 1990s, and a growing economy means there's more tax revenue for government. And that's one of the reasons the current finance minister, Bill Morneau, keeps talking about the need to grow the economy. When the economy is healthy and growing, your fiscal problems usually take care of themselves. The combination of increased revenue and spending cuts finally worked their magic and the lines crossed in 1997. The federal government went into surplus and stayed in surplus for the next 11 years. After 1995, you can see that the net debt as a share of the economy continued to fall thanks to stronger economic growth, tax increases, and spending cuts. And the net debt continued to fall all the way till 2008. Over those 11 years, there were two major reductions in government revenue due to significant tax cuts. In 2000, Paul Martin cut the individual and corporate income tax. And then in 2006 and 2007, the Stephen Harper Conservative government cut the GST by two percentage points. Each percentage point is worth about $7 billion to the federal government. So that was $14 billion in foregone revenue. No sooner was the GST cut than the next year, 2008, and Canada was hit by the global financial crisis. Like every other country, Canada unleashed a major spending program to counter the threatened collapse in the economy. The resulting deficit in 2009 was $56 billion. That's equal to 3.5% of the economy at the time. But the spending binge was short-lived. Beginning in 2010, the Conservatives began talking about eliminating the deficit and the imperative of bringing the government back into surplus. The result was more spending cuts driving the blue line, federal spending, down to just 14% of the economy by 2014. What does that mean? Well, for one thing, cuts to scientific research. The capacity of federal labs to do research into air quality, water quality, ocean and wildlife habitat has been drastically reduced and in many cases eliminated. The implications of these cutbacks for the ability of the federal government to make wise decisions in the future about things that require scientific understanding, things like pipeline routes, tanker routes, the impact of pesticides on songbirds, are probably negative. We have to ask ourselves if these cutbacks were worth it, just to get this blue line here below 15%. Perhaps it would make more sense to bring the red line back up to 15%. Bringing the red line back up to 15% would still leave federal government revenues at less than they've been any time before 2006. Would that be the end of the world? Perhaps an increase in the GST should be considered. As I've said, 2% of the GST is equal to $14 billion.
Ah, the GST, the third rail of Canadian politics. Taxes, such a fraught word for Canadians. The Stephen Harper Conservatives talked about taxes as if the government was robbing Canadians. Tax cuts, by contrast, according to Stephen Harper's government, were all about putting money back in your pocket. And who doesn't want to have more money in their pocket? The problem with this discussion is it always presents tax cuts as a winning situation. But are they? Why not ask Canadians if they'd accept a 2% increase in the GST and in exchange, perhaps university tuition could be cut or capped or more medical services could be covered by Medicare. What would Canadians choose? We badly need to have an adult discussion in this country about taxes. Tax cuts are not costless. They pay for things that Canadians say they like and want. Things like bridges and roads, schools and hospitals. So what's the takeaway? I think what this chart shows is that Canada is nowhere near a fiscal crisis in 2015, compared to where we were 20 years ago in 1995. Here's the key thing to remember. Since the economy grows every year, if the federal debt stays the same or grows less than the rate of growth in the economy, the debt as a share of the economy will continue to shrink. When we compare Canada to other countries in the G7 and to other countries like us, advanced economies with varying degrees of a social safety net, Canada's net debt is actually quite low, lower than any other country in the G7. And that leads to the obvious question, why continue to shrink the debt? Is there some special virtue in doing that? We're already at the lowest level in the entire G7. Do we get a medal pinned on our chest? Why? Economist Christopher Reagan gave one rationale for continuing to shrink the debt in an op-ed piece published in the Globe and Mail a few months ago. This is how a mainstream economist like Professor Reagan sees things. Canada is going to have to eventually turn on the spending taps to cover higher health care costs, home care for the elderly, and for rebuilding and improving public infrastructure. Now, Professor Reagan sees this happening at some point in the future, but perhaps the future is already here. Borrowing costs for the federal government are incredibly low. The government could go into financial markets right now and float a 35-year bond at an interest rate of 2.5%. It's hard to think of Canada ever getting a better deal than this or a time, like right now, where spending is more necessary. And that's because the global economy is in a precarious situation right now. Two years ago, in 2014, the International Monetary Fund began warning that the world was entering an era of subpar economic growth, resulting in higher unemployment and rising middle-class anxiety. Sound familiar? Except for the American consumer, Things are looking pretty gloomy everywhere you look. And this was before the chaos of the past two months with plunging commodity markets and stock indexes, the headlines that you've been seeing in the newspapers. The IMF and the G7 two years ago began calling for governments who had the fiscal room to start making smart investments into public infrastructure, things that would boost our productivity, things like bridges, roads, mass transit, pipelines, yes, pipelines, things that would increase our productivity and increase our national income. And spending on these things will also help the economy right now. That's because this type of spending creates good paying full-time jobs and people with those jobs spend their money on their families and all that spending helps lift the economy. As we stand here now at the start of 2016, the consensus among mainstream economists is that seven years of low interest rates following the financial crisis in 2008 are no longer working. Governments have to turn on the spending taps. And best of all, Canada's federal government is uniquely positioned to really turn on the taps. Something to think about 
as we sit here at the start of 2016, just ahead of the federal budget, trying to determine what Canada's Goldilocks deficit might be. I'm Andrew Hall. Thanks for watching.